Hey there, welcome to Farmcraft. In a previous video, I found this fallen tree in the woods, cut it up, dragged it to my sawmill, and milled it into lumber. If you want to see that whole process from the start, I'll leave a link for that video in the description. At the end of the video, I loaded it into my kiln, and now we are going to continue on and turn it into tongue and groove flooring. All right, here's a bunch of that wood. Uh, first step, planing. So here's what a board looks like before planing. It's pretty rough. You can see the marks from the sawmill. Nice looking board. But down at this end, it was a little thinner. So there's still some mill marks and an area over there that didn't clean up. But that's really close. I'm going to go ahead and plane it on the other side now. So I'm planing these down to three quarters. And so I need to move the planer bed up. So one turn is a 16th of an inch. What I just planed was 15 sixteenths. So I take about a 16th off with every pass. After I plane that, we'll be at seven eighths. We'll move it up again, we'll be at 13 sixteenths. And then one more turn, I'll be at the final just above three quarters uh, so that I have a little room to sand it on the sander over there to take the planer marks out. So here we are after planing the other side and it cleaned up very well. So that means we can flip over again. We'll get this side done. This side is the better side. So this is gonna be uh, the top uh, once I finish it because this knot here isn't too bad. That, well, that knot on the other side, it's this knot is the problem. Rather not have that knot on the top and you can see on this side, it's nice and clear. So this is gonna be my good side. So let me plane this down until this is good. And then if there's any more to take off, I'll finish it on the, on the back side. Cleaned up really well, except for right there. So I'm gonna take another pass on this side and then the board will be done. So as I'm running these through in batches, that's what I'm doing is checking the side, seeing where it cleaned up and flipping it over depending on how much I have left to take off. If you can't get the board to clean up and you just have a couple spots like that, if they're on the bottom, it's not a problem. That would that would be just fine. Uh, obviously, if it's on the top, I mean, you could hand scrape or hand sand that out, but you'd prefer the top to be nice and clean. So here's that spot and everything cleaned up. That's a great looking board. We'll get two good pieces of flooring out of that. My final dimension, just over three quarters of an inch.
it didn't want to feed through like it should. And I'm going to show you how to fix that. So there's two reasons, well three I guess, your feed rollers could be worn out, but mine aren't. If it's not feeding through, it's either that your bed has gotten sticky, or your blades are really dull. These blades are a little dull, but I should be able to keep using them. So I'm just going to wax the bed, and this is just Johnson Paste Wax, they have this everywhere. Lowe's, Home Depot, probably Walmart. You don't want to use car wax. I use this on all my tools, not just things that have a power feed like this, but anything that I'm feeding through. This makes the wood slide so much easier, just a lot less work for you. So I'm going to let that dry, and then we'll buff that off, and we'll keep going and see if that fixed it. So one way or another, it always comes back to the Johnson. I wanted to show you what I'm getting out of this tree. You know, I'm getting some really nice boards like this. I can get a couple good pieces of flooring out of that. You know, the flooring I'm, I'm keeping around two to two and three quarters wide. You don't want it this wide because you get a lot of cupping. And then I'm getting a fair amount of this. This has a little bit of a worminess to it. But overall, a good board. Now this floor is going to be a painted exterior porch floor. So that little bit of worminess is not going to be a problem. Uh, the knot actually bothers me more than the wormy, uh, but I'll get a couple boards out of that, at least one good one. Uh, this has obviously a lot of rot over here, but if you look at this side of the board, and on the other side, I've got a, a nice strip of wood there that I can make a good, you know, probably two and a half inch piece of uh, flooring. And then some of it's, you know, got defects that I just can't deal with, like this one. It has a big, big knot that's just weakening it. And then, you know, there's this little strip here, but then there's defects in that strip. So that one is a reject. I'm not going to use that for flooring, but I actually have a project coming up that this will be uh, just fine for. So I'm still going to use it. Now I need a straight edge, and we do that on the joiner. Look down that edge right there. You can see it's got a curve to it. So we're going to straighten that out uh, so that we can run that against the table saw fence. This board also has a significant bow to it. Because this is going to be thin strips of flooring, they will easily straighten out against the framing of the porch. If I was making furniture, I would also use the joiner to straighten out the face of the board and take the bow out. So 
So a planer takes a board down to a constant thickness because the table is underneath and that's what you adjust. The blades on a planer are fixed above the table and the board just runs through. A planer won't straighten things out really. It'll take a little bit of cup and stuff like that out. But if the board has a bow to it, it's just going to go through the planer with that bow and come out with the bow. A joiner will actually straighten an edge because the cutting knives are on the same surface as the table. And what that means... Oh, I can hear the safety folks uh, complain that I'm taking the guard off. But So what that means is these knives will only cut things that are level with the table. And you can see this board. I've got a spot here that's not even touching. Here it is touching. Not touching there. It's touching there. And then up here. So you can see that it's only going to take off the, the high spots, or maybe you could say the low spots since it's upside down. And with every pass, you set your depth. Right now it's taking an eighth of an inch off. What it will do, take all these high spots off, and I keep going until I get a constant cut the whole length of the board. And you can hear it when I'm doing it. You can hear intermittent cut, intermittent cut, and then once it's done, you'll hear a continuous cut all the way through. So let me do that, and then I will show you the result. It only took two passes, and now you can see this table, it's nice and flat. The board touches that table the entire way. Except for right there on the end, but that's fine. That'll get cut off anyway. So after I get a good straight edge on the joiner, I set them over on the table saw for the next step. You still have an umbilical cord attached to you. So now we're at the table saw. This I think might be the most time consuming part of this process. You have to look at each board front and back, uh, avoid knots, cut out defects where you can, and try to maximize your use of the wood. Each board basically is totally custom and requires you to measure multiple times and concentrate on each cut, resetting the fence each time. We have to avoid this knot, but this section over here is good. See how much thickness we have there. Yeah, just about two inches. I'm going to go two and an eighth. We're going to be into that knot a little bit, but then I will probably make that side of the board a tongue, which means you're going to lose a little bit more of that face. Set the saw to two and an eighth. That's what I'm left with, and I think that's going to sand out when I do the final dimensioning. And that's actually a pretty, pretty nice looking board. That'll be a good piece of flooring. Remember, this is going to be painted totally fine. This here, not so fine. Should be able to get two and three eighths twice to this.
my outdoor wood boiler, heats my hot water and the house and the shop. I'm sure people are gonna ask. A lot of times you see the you see the wood flooring that's in a home, they're small pieces. They have the butt joints on the end. Well, this is on a porch. This is gonna get wet and it needs to shed water. So you don't want that. If you do that, you're gonna get water go going in. It's gonna get into the end grain. It's just not gonna last. I need full length boards here. If I was doing an interior floor with this, it would be a lot easier. I mean, I could even use that. You know, that little piece right there could make a lot more use of this wood. So this is my Grizzly Wide Belt Sander. Um, I really like this sander. It was expensive, but I've done enough work like this that it's paid for itself many times over. If you hate sanding, you'd like a sander like this too. You know, I can just run this stuff through and the floor will be ready for paint. So let's get this stuff sanded up. All right, so here's my wood after sanding, and I've got them all face up. You know, this is going to be the floor that you see. I don't know how it shows on video to my eye. There's really nothing to see there. I don't see any marks or anything. Now, if I turn it over, can you see the horizontal lines there? I hope that's showing up. Let me try. Yeah, I think that's showing up. So those horizontal lines are all the from the planer knives. The planer leaves marks that uh, would show up much more once you've put paint on it. So you don't wanna leave it like that, but these, nice and smooth after running through the sander, are all ready to paint. Now, I still have to put the tongue and groove on there. We'll do that next. All right, now to do the tongue and groove, I'm gonna use my router table. So this is a Porter Cable 15 amp router. This router table is one of the earliest woodworking projects I built. It's not perfect, but uh, I do like it. It was a plan, I think, from like the New Yankee workshop, but I'm sure there are many plans out there available. What I like about it is the fence. This is all made out of MDF, has these gussets in it to keep it square. These loosen and allow this slide to move. And the way that works, there's a little T-slot in it. Here, I'll take it all the way off. See, there's a T-slot cut in there so that it can go on those bolts. And then once you tighten these handles, it'll lock it in position. And that's how these are working too. Um, down under there, there's some T-bolts that reach under there and then pinch the fence down to the table. It's got dust collection on it, both top and bottom. And it has formica on it, which takes wax really well. It holds up to you know a lot of rubbing, which you're gonna be doing. Pretty nice table. Uh, if you wanna do molding and you know make trim and tongue and groove things, you definitely need a router table. Uh, the nice things is it has all these drawers to hold your bits. You know, I've got a bunch of quarter inch bits there. I've got, I think, half inch round over bits over here. And what am I looking for here? The tongue and groove bits are right here. You've got one bit that's going to cut the top and bottom off the board and leave a tongue in the center. 
And then you've got the opposite of that. This is going to cut the center out of the board and make a groove. And those two will fit together and leave you with good tongue and groove flooring. See that bow in that board? You know, it's still usable because with a little bit of down pressure, you can straighten it out. But when I was running it on the table, it pushed itself up and you can see the tongue came way out of the center. And then I pushed it down again and got it back centered, but uh, obviously that can't be used. Uh, so I'm just gonna cut that tongue off and we'll run that one again. I cranked this down really tight, but you can see I kind of overdid it. I messed up my feather board. I'm gonna have to make another one of those. These are all the same height, so I don't really need a feather board for this dimension because they're all exactly the same. So I made this steel plate and just screwed it into the T-slot so that won't allow the board to lift up off the table. Here's a woodworking tip. Notice this board barely contacts the feather board and isn't really being pushed against the fence. I just push a spacer in there to increase the pressure. I use several widths of spacers for this because my boards are a varying width and I wax the spacers so that it slides easily. Because there are no butt joints in my floor and the flooring is full length, the width really doesn't matter. When you have a floor with short boards and butt joints, all the boards in a row need to be exactly the same width. So here's a heart pine floor that I did some years ago, and it has varying widths. You have to pick a number and all the boards have to be exactly the same. Because as you go down that line, if there's any variation in width, you're gonna have gaps. So they're all, all exactly the same all the way down the line. So now I've got the groove cutting bit in there. That's gonna cut this profile. And this is where having some scraps really comes in handy. When I do the groove, they have to be it has to be at the right height. All of the time I have the good face against the table. That also keeps things consistent. And then you feel across and you see, are you matching upright? Because if you're not, you either need to go up or down with your groove cutter to get so that your face will be, will be smooth. My other advice, if you're doing anything like this, once you get your machine set up to where you're happy with it, tighten everything down. Crank that router bit in place. Crank the router in place because as you're sitting there running stuff through, if something moves just a tiny bit, you can mess up an awful lot of wood. Ask me how I know. And because I never want to have to deal with this floor again, I decided to paint the backs. I'll paint the top once it's down, and that way it'll be sealed on both sides. I'm using a traditional linseed oil paint for this. Paint is one of the few things where the traditional version was actually better than the modern version. I'm convinced the only reason we use petroleum-based paints now is because it's a byproduct of all the petroleum that we use, which makes it cheap. Linseed oil paint is a little more expensive, but it lasts longer, it never peels, it's easy to restore, you can always just put another coat on, it doesn't off-gas any fumes, and in the long run it ends up cheaper for you. It's really good stuff. Well that took a little longer than expected. That's a lot of boards to, 
to paint. And these look a little rough, but remember this is the backs and this is just a primer coat. The final coat uh, on the top is gonna look a lot more uniform and a lot smoother. So I'd like to show this uh, being installed on the porch, but I have more work to do on the porch before this is gonna be ready. And the weather's also not conducive. But luckily, I have another porch that I did this already. And um, this floor has been down for several years. Now, this is ugly and I'm gonna fix that. This was an experiment. I put this down, I didn't put any finish on it. I wanted to see if it would just gray and, and kind of look okay with no maintenance required. Um, but uh, I, as you can see, it's stained and uh, I'm calling this a failure. So this is getting linseed oil paint too after I finish the, uh, the current porch that I'm working on. But here you can see I've got varying widths, um, just like I do on the interior but I don't have to worry about the exact dimension of that width. The board goes the entire length of the porch and then stops. So, you know, I could have a board with a totally unique width in here and it wouldn't be a problem. So look out for that in a future video. Hope you guys enjoyed. We'll see you on the next one.